Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. I'm excited about today's special. We got Glenn Mason, former Gophers head coach, joining me. Glenn is going to tell us some sneaky little tidbits. Tidbits. There's some stuff about what he would currently do if he were the Gophers head coach. How would he handle handle the transfer portal? And also, what's his favorite memory? Is it Ohio State? Is it Penn State? Or is it something that we're not even close to? Stay tuned. Coming up next. Locked on Sports Minnesota podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Welcome to the Ron Johnson Show, and I'm your host, Ron Johnson. Today's episode, as I say, we're going to have Glenn Mason coming up soon. But remember... You can now find Locked On Sports Minnesota on Amazon Fire and Roku. Download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app to get all your favorite shows. Well, as promised, head coach Glenn Mason is joining me on the Ron Johnson Show. Uh, If you know anything about my story and Glenn Mason, it didn't start off great with uh, Reggie Mitchell coming to my high school. Did not get let into the high school because my head coach, I found out later, had kind of a deal with a couple schools, one of them being Michigan. Um, and and Lloyd Carr wasn't happy when he found out I was going to go to uh, Minnesota. Penn State also had come by, but Joe Paterno, that was my last visit. I appreciate Mason as we'll get into the story of how he didn't pressure me like some coaches do when you leave after your visit and allowed me to go home and think about what school I wanted to pick. And uh, after I called Joe Paterno, he wasn't happy as well, which that's why as we get into this week, some of the things that happened this Penn State week were awesome because I remember all the stuff Jay Paterno told me when I told him I was going to go to Minnesota and I was declining my last visit to Penn State. My best friend Spice Adams ended up going to Penn State. But as we bring Glenn Mason into the show, uh, I want to thank Glenn Mason for joining me. As, as I uh, we noticed, Glenn Mason doesn't it doesn't look like Minnesota because the sun is hitting his face a little too nice. Uh, he's down in Florida. But coach, you, you've had a chance to coach Eric Decker or recruit Eric Decker, myself, uh, uh, you got Lawrence Maroney, you got Marion Barber, uh, you coach Ben Hamilton, you got Karan Riley in there, uh, Greg White, Styles G. White, because he doesn't go by Greg anymore. But of all those players, coach, I mean, it, the Florida house, like what bowl game did we get you in that got you that house? Well, it had nothing to do with winning. It had, had to do with <laughs> me being compensated for all the grief I had to put up with coaching all you guys. <laughs> And so you look at, uh, I remember this story, and this just hit me in my head. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but watching Aaron Donald get into a fight with another team, also got into a fight with his teammates before in practice as well. Um, there was a time when, like, Karan Riley got into a fight during practice, and you just kicked him out of practice that week, and or not that week, that day. Uh, how did you handle that as a coach? Like, when players would get into it with each other, when there would be skirmishes, uh, like, what, what was going through your head? Because I know there was some off-the-field stuff you had to deal with, too, with fights. Like, as a head coach, like, because you're worried about coaching, are you going to class, and now you got to deal with fights. Like, how did you deal with that kind of stuff? Well, you know, Ron, as far as fighting on the field, and I know some coaches let it go. They think that's, you know, good. You see who the real aggressive guys are. And, you know, I always thought that you practice to prepare for the game. And yeah. if you let guys swing at each other, get in a fight, uh, you know, during practice, well, what's going to keep them doing it? You're preparing for them to do it in the game. And if you do it in the game, it's going to be a 15-yard penalty. Uh, it might cost you a game. And, you know, it, it goes back to when I first was a head coach at Kent State. And, man, those guys used to fight every second up there and didn't win any games, but they fight on the field. And I, I couldn't get them to stop. And one day I, I, I just blew the whistle when guy, two guys were fighting. And I said, okay, I called the whole team up. And I said, okay, you guys want to see who's tough? All right, let's do up-downs, you two guys, until one guy quits. You know, Ron, that's the last time I ever had a fight on that football field. Wow. I, <laughs> I, I remember I had – I think I, uh, Vic Adamley made me do up-downs for fumbling the ball. Uh, no, no, it wasn't a fumble. It was a celebration. I, my first touchdown against Houston – my freshman year, I did some. I don't. Know, I mean, I didn't know you weren't supposed to celebrate in college. I wasn't paying attention. And then, yeah, I celebrated. And Vic Allen said, "Okay, you want to celebrate?" 
you're going to do this until celebrations are out of your head. So I don't think I ever celebrated again to like my senior year when at that point it was okay. We had switched to the great gloves. All right, coach. And so the week of Penn State, this is Penn State week. We all know I got LeVar Arrington texting me, Spice Adams. I got Penn State. I just posted Roll the Boat yesterday because I was working out at Lifetime Fitness. And I'm just saying beat Penn State. I got a ton of Penn State people. I didn't even know were Penn State fans saying, yeah, right. But we'll go back to 1999. Uh, huge week for Minnesota going in to play number two in the country, Penn State. Nobody gave us a chance. But you did tell us stories about 1997 and Thomas Hamner, what happened with him. But then you did something unique. LeVar Arrington was blocking a ton of field goals. He was also beating up punters. But you got Dan freshman kicker Dan Nystrom ready. Because we didn't think it would come down to a kick, but you were like, you know what? You never know. We lost by one point before. It might come down to a kick. I'm going to have this kid ready. What did you do that week to kind of get everybody going? Well, you know, it's funny because you talk about LeVar Arrington. He's the best-looking number 11 ever to play college football, I can tell you that. And his sidekick, Brown, you know, they went number one and number two in the NFL draft that year. Besides being great players, it was unbelievable the number of um, – field goals that they blocked over their career and they could get up so high. So I was looking at film on Sunday and I don't want to make me think of it, but I had a freshman place kicker, Dan Nystrom. So I said, man, we got to work on getting the ball. But I was thinking they'd block his extra points to be quite honest with you. And uh, so we started kicking there and uh, had guys stand with their hands up. And after he got a little better than that, I had him stand on someone's back and he got better than that. Then I got a ladder out there and, all the players, they were all laughing. They think this is crazy. They had to stand on the ladder, and, you know, Dan knocked a few of them off. But after a while, he, he started getting the ball up, and then, lo and behold, he comes down to the end of the game uh, to win. He's running on the field to kick, obviously, a pressure, pressure field goal there in Beaver Stadium, and all the players were yelling, remember the ladder, and he kicked it, and the rest <laughs> was history. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember some plays, and Billy, we had Billy Cockrum on yesterday, and he he talked about this uh, last kind of series of the game. We're down, we're driving down though, but we're on like I think our twenty to start the drive. We have to go like eighty yards to score, or you know, I think like seventy yards to get in the field goal range or whatever. And Billy brought up that the first play he got coming from the sideline was hail mary. Uh, what what were what was you and Coach Peterson going through when you decided to just throw a Hail Mary from the 20? Well, you know, the, the game plan for that week, uh, Ron, if you remember, I, I talked uh, to the, uh, the players and I said, hey, our game plan is patience. And the reason I said that, when I was watching the film, every time that uh, Penn State got somebody in a third and passing situation, they went backwards. So mm -hmm. I told the coaches, offensive coaches, we get to a third and long or whatever, uh, run quarterback sneak, but don't take the ball off the line because these guys are too good. Patience, patience, patience. So Penn State decided to to punt the ball rather than go for it on fourth down in their ter in our territory. Uh, and we got the ball in the 20-yard line in the first play. I said, throw the Hail Mary. And all the coaches <laughs> said, the Hail Mary, because as you know, normally the Hail Mary is a desperation play at the end of the game. The Hail Mary, why? I said, I'm out of patience. Throw the Hail Mary. <laughs> and lo and behold, you caught it, and the game was on. I'm not going to lie. We were in the huddle, and when you caught Hail Mary, Arthur Bruce looked at me and was like, who's going to tip it? And we all literally kind of laughed because we are like, wait, the Hail Mary all week we had been tipped. Like, I was tipping it to somebody to catch it. And so – I literally, I mean, I'm a sophomore, 19 years old in Penn State. 97,000 fans are screaming at us because we're backed up. They're trying to, get, and we were all like, I think that actually like let our guards down because we were so caught off guard. We had a good moment because I remember thinking like, a Hail Mary is supposed to be a tip to somebody coming behind me. And so Billy tells a story. He said when he saw the Hail Mary, he said for some reason, uh, I think Dustin Fox was his name, number four, had backed way off thinking Billy's arm was stronger than that. And I was wide open, so we just threw it. And you're right. And then we caught it, and me and Luke Leverson and uh, Arlen Bruce were standing there like, man, we, we can do this. And then, you know, let's fast forward to the next, you know, you, you run some plays, run some plays, and you come back to it again. Why Hail Mary at that moment and not try to just go for like a third and, you know, seven or third and eight play? I mean, we ran the Hail Jane, the next one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. It just uh... – you know, we were really struggling. They're a good defense, and 
the Hail Mary worked. Why not the Hail Jane? <laughs> but, you, know, you talk about the, the, when we call the Hail Mary and you're standing on the sideline, and I guess it's a desperation call, but you catch it. And all of a sudden I thought to myself, damn, it worked. I can't believe it, you know? <laughs> and uh, and then we run the, uh, the Hail Jane, which is the same thing as the Hail Mary, except the inside receiver breaks out, like you know. And now it's tipped and Arlen Bruce makes a diving catch. And now we got a chance at the field goal to win the game. Yeah, because I remember uh, the the I think it was Fox again. He he I heard him and the other coach talking, and I I wasn't understanding. And going back, and I talked to Spice Lavar Arrington about this. Their coach actually said, if you get a pass interference, they're only going to get 15 yards, which actually made sense now thinking about that because that would have put us in field goal range. And so he did purposefully grab because if you watch, he's grabbing my arms, pulling me backwards. And I think the refs were going to swallow the flag. Like, they were not going to let that game in on the flag. I hit it, and then all of a sudden I fall back, and I thought the game was over. Like, I, I'm laying back. I don't know if I was going to cry. I have no idea what I was going to do, but I laid back. And then it was silent, which was weird because it hadn't been quiet there all day. And then I look up, and I see Arlen. I see our side. Like, Delvin Jones is, like, on the field. Everybody's jumping around. We're confused of what to do. I, Billy screaming, spike, spike, spike. And then – you bring Dan Nystrom out. When, in that moment, because everybody's praying, guys are down, everybody's doing their thing. In that moment when Dan Nystrom trots out there uh, to go for the field goal, what's like? what moments or what thoughts are you having in that moment? Well, you know, obviously it's a, it's a pressure situation, you know, for Dan Nystrom. And, uh, you know, I always thought if you, if you don't have anything to say to a guy to get him to relax, just don't say anything to him, you know? And I couldn't come up with anything at that point for Dan Nystrom, <laughs> except for everybody yelling, remember the ladder, the ladder. And I think Dan was laughing about that. But, you know, besides working on Dan Nystrom, you remember we worked hard on the protection of the guys up front. And yeah. at that moment, I thought, you know, we have done everything possibly we could to prepare for this moment. You know, nothing, what else would I have done? Nothing. We did everything. We worked so hard, inordinately hard, spent more time on extra point and field goal protection that week. And the other thing that goes unnoticed, um, but Ryan Roth, the left guard, I have a fill, I have a picture in my basement of him straining, blocking about a ton of defensive linemen trying to run over him, just straining to keep him out of there. It was a picture perfect play. Yeah, I mean, in, in the picture, we always give Ryan Reynolds crap for this, our punter. He didn't have his mouthpiece in. It's in his sock. So, I mean, there's little things here and there. Uh, he fumbled the snap, which actually made it better because LeVar Arrington is actually on the way down because uh, LeVar has talked about that on the kick. Like, he, he said either he mistimed it, but no, he actually timed it perfectly. Not, uh, Reynolds kind of like, he, he kind of fumbled it a little bit, but he got it up. Dan hesitated and then made the kick. And then it was pandemonium. But do you remember Alex Haas, I think, is carrying you around the field for a little bit. And that's one of the pictures that was like blown up in our uh, in the in the in the facility. Do you even remember that or did you did everything just go crazy at that moment? And you didn't even realize you were being carried across the field by a player. Oh, no, I, I remember Alex Haas. You know, he's not carrying me. I leaped out there and and I have that <laughs> picture. I hey, that's the highest I've ever jumped in my life. <laughs> The truth. <laughs> oh man. So when you think about your time though, coaching in Minnesota, you know, uh, rest in peace to Marion Barber. Uh, you you've told some great Marion Barber Lawrence Maroney stories. Uh, but there's one with them on a moped. And, and I've heard yeah. that story before. Uh, because I mean that was probably what four thousand yards on a moped going across. But what what was that like driving down Dinky Town and you see your two star running backs? on a moped 4,000 yards heck that was my career on that moped are you kidding me no it was after practice and uh you know those guys were characters uh, to say the least and i'm stopped at a light and all of a sudden there goes speeding through the moped it, on a moped is lawrence maroney driving with marion barber on the back no helmet laughing <laughs> not paying attention and I thought to myself, good God, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> and Lawrence, you know, Lawrence tells a story like, you know, they just love to have fun and do stuff. But, um, you know, again, you've had some iconic 
moments at Minnesota. I don't even know if you realize that, you know, as far as me being a player, you think it because we had Ron Dane early on and he talked about playing against Minnesota is one of his toughest because of the defense and how everything was funneled. And he, you know, it, we were not going to let Ron Dane beat us. Uh, you look at the Purdue game, the overtime where they cheated us. I think Tony Henderson was in. Uh, Star Tribune had a picture of that. Um, you, you know, you go back to the uh, when I wasn't there, but the Michigan uh, team had a comeback. But then you go down to Michigan and beat them. All the punter had to do was punt the ball, and, they, and you guys win the game against Wisconsin. Uh, when you think about all of those moments, all the players, you know, the, the Phillip Rivers having a great game against us with NC State, I don't still don't know to this day. I will tell you now, since I'm not on the team anymore, you're not the coach. Daryl Reed, Jason Green, like those players were drunk. Like they were drunk all week. They had nothing left in the tank to play the second half of that that NC State game. But when you look at games like that, players like that, like what what are some of the fondest memories you have uh, of coaching those Gopher days? Well, I only, I only remember the good good games, the good plays. I kind of blocked those other ones, uh, you know, out of my mind. But you know, you mentioned uh, a, a number of them. But you know, uh, when we went to Columbus, if you remember that game, because yeah. you had oh, a yeah. whale. Of oh, yeah. And, you know, uh, Minnesota hadn't won in Columbus since 1949. I know no players were born then because I wasn't even born then, you know. And the thing I remember about that game, uh, I remember in the, the meeting before we went to the stadium that day, I said, fellas, let me tell you, they got 100,000 people there and they're loud and they yell and they scream. But I'm going to tell you, if they get quiet, uh, we're doing good. I said, if they start to boo, we do, we're do. we doing real good. And toward the end of the game, I forget the player, he came up to me and he said, hey, coach, we're doing great. I said, why do you say that? He says, because they're leaving. And I'll never <laughs> forget. That. He was exactly right. And, and I mean, going to Ohio State, that's your alma mater. You know, you, you coach there. You talk about the stories. Of, uh, of being a coach there. Uh, you told us all the, you know, the things to prepare for at Ohio State, but it was one thing, and I didn't remember this, Paul Rovenak, who's the current SSID for the Gophers uh, media. He actually said he interviewed me after the game because he was covering Ohio State at the time. He said, my comment was, well, I guess they tried it. It didn't work. How'd that work out for him? And it, <laughs> it literally, I felt like that was a Glenn Mason-like comment in my head because uh, we talk about the role of boat culture and how Tanner Morgan kind of has embodied uh, PJ Fleck. And I think like your Macisms, like kind of started to come on a lot of the play. Like we started to all like kind of feel that way, have certain little, you know, comments here and there. Uh, so, you know, for all the people that talk about, you know, my TV jokes I make, I mean, you can blame Glenn Mason for that because I, I got them from Mace. <laughs> but coach, when you know, again, beating Ohio State and there's on the video, you know, there's your son coming up to you. There's other people on the sideline hugging you. Um, just as being a former grad too, what what was that whole experience like? You know, when when you when you get in, the player comes, he said it's a great day. But at any point in that game, because it felt like we had control from the start. But at any point in that game, did you feel like we this could melt down, or did you just feel like Travis Cole, you know, Karan Ride, that defense, everybody was hitting on all cylinders that day? Yeah, you know, we were really playing well that day. You know, I I don't know if we ever played, you know, start to finish a better game against a quality opponent than then we did that game. But, you know, some of the things that we planned, I mean, it worked like a T. As you know, in the passing game, and, you know, Travis Cole was a good quarterback. That was by far the best day he ever had. He wasn't going to be a pro guy and, and play after, you know, college football. The day that you had, but, you know, the game plan that we had seemed to unfold. And what we did, we did a lot of different formations, and we thought that would confuse that defense, you know, and it did. And I remember uh, Jermaine Mays, you know, we put that pump block in and we said, you know, if we call this, it's blocked. And yeah. sure enough, we called it blocked for a touchdown. And uh, I remember we had one defense called uh, David Gibbs said, you know, if, uh, if we call this defense, if we think they're going to run the boot, it's a big play. It's at least a sack, if not a pummel, a, a fumble. And sure enough, he, he looked at me before they ran the play and he said, here it comes. They're gonna have. They're gonna run the boot, and we've got the call on it. Sure enough, that's what happened. It was one of those days that you really enjoyed coaching because it just seemed everybody, that everything that you're prepared for, was happening right before in your eyes. 
And, and coach, thinking about, you know, as we we got one more question before we jump into the daily three with myself, you and Sam. Uh, but when you look at your, uh, your, 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 your storied history there, you look at TCF bank, but let's, and then you look at, you know, you had to play the Metrodome, but when you look at the transfer portal, I always wanted to know this in your perspective. Uh, when you think about the transfer portal, because uh, you had grad trans or not grad, but you had transfers come in. Uh, you had guys, you know, Karan left SMU, Jack Brewer left SMU and came to Minnesota. You've had that, but if you had access to the transfer portal, uh, do you think you would have dove in head first, or would you still have tried to build it from high school players? Well, I don't like the the transfer portal. I I think uh, you know when you look at it. I try to explain to people. I said it'd be like. Uh, if everybody on every team in the NFL was an unrestricted free agent, it would be chaos. Yeah. And that's really what could happen in, in college you know, football. I would think that if I was still coaching, you'd have to, if it, like it or not, you'd have to get involved uh, in the portal. Uh, mm -hmm. But one of the things that I liked, that, which you touched on, I like recruiting the high school player um, because – you know, we by and large, we weren't going to be able to recruit guys that were going to go out early and go to the National Football League. We had to recruit guys that that had the really good football players but had a great upside potential to develop. And you could develop them over a four- or five-year period. And that's what I liked. And that's why I really didn't do much junior college recruiting. But if I was coaching right now, you'd have to be involved in the portal. <laughs> well, up next, we got the daily three. That's three questions. Three minutes each, myself, Glenn Mason. Sam's going to divvy out points. Of course, he's always going to pick the guests to win. Uh, but before we jump into that, we have a word from our sponsors. Yes, we do. BetOnline.net is the number one source for football betting info this season. Gophers in Penn State this weekend, five-point underdogs. We've been watching that line all week. Started out at four and a half, moving a little bit toward Penn State. Uh, you can get that and plenty more at BetOnline.net. It's NBA, NHL, uh, NFL, golf, MMA. It's all there. Check it out on your mobile device. Bet online where the game starts. All right, Coach. I don't know how much of a rah-rah guy you were. I want to hear about motivational speeches or, or times you address the team pregame or halftime, uh, something that you remember that was particularly effective. Coach, I'll give the floor to you. Uh, what, where did you stand as far as the pregame speech went? Well, I don't know. You always had to give some type of talk. And, uh, you know, you, if you think that what you say right before the game is going to make a difference, it's probably not. But one thing sticks out was that uh, the time before 2005 that we played at Michigan, and this is, at, I think, appropriate because of what happened with Michigan and Penn State last week, but I remember the time before 2005, uh, when, at halftime, when we were starting to go up the tunnel, both teams go up the tunnel, and the tunnel's right on the sideline of the visiting team. As we were kind of walking up that tunnel, Michigan ran up that tunnel and sprinted right past us. And I know all, I was looking at uh, Michigan run bias and all the players. So in 2005, we played there. I said, fellas, I'm going to tell you, at halftime, I don't care if we're up by 10 or down by 10. When we hit halftime, we're, every guy's going to turn and sprint up that tunnel. There's not going to be a Michigan player that beats us to their locker room before we get in our locker room. And that's what we did. And I stayed behind to watch. And you know what? Michigan was confused. They couldn't believe what, what happened to Minnesota. Where did they go? I'll never forget that talk. Did it have an effect on the game? I don't know. I think it did. Yeah, Coach, because when you think about that, Michigan State or Michigan versus Penn State, Michigan versus Ohio State, that happens where they, I think they're aware of that too. And there's been fights every time. It's not worked out in the team that tries to fight them. They beat Ohio State when they try to fight them. They beat Penn State. When they, but that, that's a thing. So maybe Ohio State and Penn State should have reached out to you and asked because that's the key. You got to beat them in there. You can't try to go in at the same time because it's going to be a fight and they want to bully you. Like that's, that's their thing. My, my favorite speech, and I'm going to stick to a Glenn Mason speech because uh, I think Brian Billick had some speeches for us, but honestly, we were a defensive-driven team, so our, our speeches were really predicated on like Ray Lewis and what Ray Lewis is going to tell us, and uh, getting ready for the pregame celebration. It was it was a it was a it was a show. But when it came to Glenn Mason's speeches, the best part of it was the play hard, and he was going to say something about blink of an eye, eight and three, three and eight. 
But this is not the best part of it. The best part was going to Oregon. Or no, sorry, playing Oregon in the bowl game. And I don't know if Mace remembers this, but there was a talent show. And I think Derek Burns had to get up, and his talent for the day was he was going to mimic Glenn Mason. I think it was Derek Burns. And he did the best Glenn Mason like speech ever. I mean, we're gonna have to get we're gonna have to get Derek on there because he's now part of the uh, NIL collective for the Gophers. We we'll have to get Derek Burns on here to do that. But he did the perfect Glenn Mason speech. I think I still have it on DVD somewhere or VHS. But it was spot on. He hit the eight and three, three and eight. He hit the uh, don't blink, and then he hit the play hard because Mason always would finish with and remember play hard. But I'll never forget being. I had to be a freshman. I think the first time I ever heard Mace tell us the don't blink. And for people eight and three, three and eight, this is before we played 12 games, we played 11. Mace told us, don't blink. You should have seen me. I think it was Jermaine Mays. And I looked at Jermaine Mays and Jermaine's like eyes were like wide open. And I think Mays took don't blink literal. Like coach said, don't blink. So I'm not going to blink before we get out there. <laughs> so when I saw Mays do that, I'm thinking like, wait, is he right? Like, is he talking about like literally don't blink? Like, or is he? And then I thought about it later. I'm like, no, it's figurative. May, May, Mason or uh, Mays, Jermaine Mays is an idiot. I'm like, it's it's figurative. It's not literal. But I will never forget, like, a couple freshmen, we were all kind of like, don't blink. Like, wait a minute. And Mays was, like, sitting there like this because he's like, I'm not – Coach Sammy don't blink, so I'm not going to blink. And to this day, we now know Mays is really literal because Joker Phillips gave him a test. Uh, and you had to tell everybody what routes X and Z. Mays literally – and Joker probably never told you this, Mays. Mays wrote – on the question like two through 10, I play X. He was not gonna answer the rest of the questions because he's like, I don't need to know what the Z's doing. I don't need to know what the Y's, I play X. Joker like could not stop laughing, trying to do exactly what Glenn Mason told us to do. <laughs> That's so good. Um, I've got another question for you both. Um, and maybe we already touched on this, but I'm curious from your playing career, Ron, your coaching career, Coach Mason, what is one play that people stop you on the street and they want to talk to you about? Maybe it was Hail Mary, Hail Jane, Dan Nystrom, or, or was it something else? Coach, we'll let you go first. Well, you know, we've kind of beat uh, this to death, but, uh, you know, especially because it's Penn State week. And that was a, that was a, a signature win uh, during my tenure. You know, I think that that gave what we were trying to do at Minnesota, you know, some credibility was to win it at Penn State. Uh, but that throw, that Hail Mary that Ron caught at midstream, you know, Minnesota people talk about a little bit, but let me tell you about the Penn State people. When I travel and go around, it's amazing how many of those Penn Staters will stop me and talk to me and they'll talk about that play and, they, and they'll look at me and they say, you guys ruined our season because they thought they were going to be national champs and we derailed them. But if there's one play that kept getting brought up over and over and over is the Hail Mary to Ron Johnson. Yeah, I'd say uh, Penn State players, so Spice Adams, uh, Eric McCool, LeVar Arrington, for years they called me fluky. Like they said that whole game was a fluke. Like those plays were fluky. Uh, they said the rest were on our side. Um, so Penn State comes up. Ohio State, of course, comes up because of the game we had. But it depends on the play. Like, I've actually met an Illinois girl. She ran track. I, I got to travel with my wife uh, after I graduated and played. I went to a couple of track meets. And a girl from Illinois, I guess I broke her boyfriend's leg when we play Illinois because we, we were taught to cut block back then. I don't know if players still cut block. Uh, but we were, we were trying to get DBs on the ground. Like, if we cut them and the running back gets through, they have to actually get up again and then try to make the tackle, which is hard. And I guess he, the turf grabbed his leg. I kept going and broke his leg. So that's a play, like, whenever I run into Illinois people, like Brandon Lloyd, they're like, dude, my, my, that was my boy. He still talks about to this day that Ron Johnson broke my leg. And I feel so bad because I'm like, that's not what I meant to do. Like, I wasn't planning on going out there and trying to break somebody's leg. And I, I mean, I, to this day, I never said this, but it took me a while to cut block again. Like it probably took me a game or two. Cause I was just like, that doesn't seem right. Like what if a guy gets caught on his turf again? Cause that turf was horrible. Um, but yeah, it'd have to be that one. And then of course, I think a lot of Minnesota fans uh, love to remember the Wisconsin game. It wasn't like a, a glorious game. Cause we didn't go to a bowl game that year, but we beat Wisconsin for my final game of my senior year. We got the ax and it had been a while since Minnesota had the axe. And so 
I think that was kind of what, because that kind of started it. We had the X then, and then the 2003 Mace, I think you guys got it back again. Uh, and then Brewster and some of those, they didn't see it. Like, they didn't see the axe for a while. So a lot of people uh, love to come up and talk about the axe because that was kind of the start of feeling like, you know what, Minnesota can beat Wisconsin. Uh, and Mace definitely got it started. So I think that would be another one. There's some good memories there. I got one more question for you both. If I asked you in 2002, 20 years ago, would you be in the media today in some fashion? What would you have said? Coach Mason. No way. Are you <laughs> kidding me? Huh? I mean, I kind of went over the dark side when I went work work for the for the uh, uh, Big Ten Network, and maybe what's even more surprising than that, people still say, "How can you be on the same radio show with Dan Barrero? That guy used to absolutely kill you, destroy you. He never said anything good about you, and now you're on the same radio show." But Never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd be on the other side of the table. And Mace, do you remember, uh, like, I don't know if you remember this, but Sid Hartman, like my first experience with Sid Hartman, um, he walked onto the field in the middle of practice and you literally looked over like, who the F does this guy think he is? And then everybody, I think, kind of, you, you know, you were just messing around with him, but everybody was just like, oh, that's just Sid. That's how Sid, and same trench coat, same microphone and, and recorder. But I don't know if you remember that, like Sid Hartman coming out. And it was almost like we – I wouldn't have thought that either because it felt like you didn't like talking to the media because they would show up to practices, win or lose. They were there. Do you remember that when Sid would, like, walk in the middle of practices? Oh, I, I can remember a lot of things about Sid. Uh, he'd walk into a staff meeting and I'd throw him out. And he'd say, well, i always done that. You're not doing it anymore, I can tell you that. Uh, and then, you know – I, one time, the funniest time was Sid Hartman. Uh, I'm in the, the men's room standing at the urinal, and he comes in with that tape recorder and wants to do an interview. I mean, I, you can't make it up, but that's what used to happen with that guy. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, the PP interview. <laughs> uh, for me, I would say... Uh, yes and no. Like, I, I did like the camera. Like, I, I enjoyed doing interviews with the media. Um, I would say I, I definitely didn't think I would be doing this exactly like, you know, Fox 9's pregame show, K-Fan, postgame Viking stuff. Like, I never understood it. I did I did like being in front of the camera, though. Uh, I did enjoy uh, doing the interviews. It was fun. I loved, like, ragging teammates when they were getting interviewed. Um, but to this, like, you know, growth of, like, the Vikings, definitely not. Like, I, I definitely probably didn't see that coming. Um, but, but I definitely enjoyed it. Now, Mace, I, I personally, though, I, I saw you doing something like this, entertaining people, like being on TV, because like that's what you did. Every recruiting visit, like, because eventually I had to become the recruiter, and you guys would always stick me with like a Detroit kid or a receiver that we really wanted to get. And I'm pretty sure I was like 90%, like I told Joker that, I was like 90% completion on getting recruits to sign here. Um, but you, you did a great job of like presenting to like the, the players so i'm like you know like i i could see it like i, I saw it in you because just what you would say and half the time too we'd be like when is that gonna happen because you would bring up like the oh we're gonna build a new stadium and, and we're raising funds for this <laughs> we're gonna get a we're gonna get a new uh workout facility you know we just got a new weight room and we're all sitting back like when is this gonna happen because you know but i do know the new weight room came when i got there because my recruiting visit that weight room was a dungeon so you did get that done you got the new weight room and uh, i was definitely appreciative uh, my wife appreciated it because I know, uh, you know, her as a track athlete, she got to work out and I still look good. Uh, so she definitely thanks you for that. But <laughs> I want to thank Glenn Mason for joining me on the Ron Johnson show. Uh, really appreciate it, coach. Love the stories. Uh, looking forward to hear more. And, and fans, make sure you comment, like, share. Let us know what was your favorite Glenn Mason moment? What was your favorite Glenn Mason game? Is there a game that stands out to you that you're sitting back like, ah, Mason could not have done better? Lawrence Maroney, Marion Barber, Eric Decker. Who was your favorite gopher that Mason coached? And remember, when you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota, you're getting endless Vikings talk with local experts. Subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast feed wherever you find your podcast and find our videos on Locked On Sports Minnesota's YouTube channel. Thank you and have a great day.